All was quiet at Cessnock Council today, a contrast to the rowdy gathering last night over the Dross plant proposal. After constant disruptions, a rescission motion was eventually lodged, calling for councillors to rethink their support for the plant. That will be dealt with at a later date. Last night's meeting became so heated that at one stage police were called, although they stayed outside and took no action. Inside, Councillor Maybury had his face slapped by his sister-in-law. He today described some of the protesters' actions as disgraceful. I think the few minority group that was amongst the dissenters uh, behaved intolerably and uh, I don't want to be associated with people that behave like that. Councillor Maybury believes that with strict conditions, the Dross plant will benefit Curry, providing employment to an area desperately lacking in jobs. However, his view is up against that of his brother Colin, who is leading the charge to have the proposal shelved. Councillor Maybury says his family is suffering by the feuding caused by the proposal. It is difficult. Uh, I've got four brothers besides myself, and... Uh, to have the split, uh, especially I'm concerned about my mother. Colin Maybury agrees the family is being affected, however he defends his wife's actions in hitting his brother. It was in the heat of the moment and he provoked her a little bit, so uh, I, don't think, I don't think it means all that much. Despite the feuding, Colin Maybury remains determined to do all he can to stop the plant being built in Curry. We've applied to the ICAC and we have an appointment with them for next Tuesday morning and we're going down there to show that the uh, Department of Planning used, I believe, criminal conspiracy in trying to get this through without full discussion and communication to the community. With the breakers out of the National League this season, the club's management is looking to something new. Today, a seven-a-side competition was launched, the breakers admitting they're telling the National Soccer League they're still around. To show them that, yes, we are we are starting our uh, procedure now to try and uh, reinforce back into the NSL, and we, uh, we're certainly going to make a, a damn good uh, fist of it. The breakers are hoping all the top local clubs will take part in the seven-a-side comp starting from November 4th, running 15 weeks. Edgeworth and Highfields Azuri are two of the teams interested. The winning side will take home $2,500 in prize money. It's the first time the Super Series and the Women's Devondale circuit has been staged in Newcastle and this morning its main combatants were on show. Amongst them, former Swansea Belmont representative and 1992-93 series winner Guy Andrews, who's returned to his old backyard chasing a win after finishing fifth in the first round. You know, to do it in front of a home crowd and, uh, you know, first time in Newcastle, I've been trying to get, a, get the Uncle Toby's crowd to come here for quite a few years and to, uh, to take it out first up would be great. With Trevor Handy still not totally fit due to a lingering illness, Gold Coast winner Scott Thompson is once again expected to make his presence felt, as is his training partner, the Lakes Drew Blatchford, his confidence high after leading for the first half of the series opener. I know when the gun goes now that I can just go with everyone and I'm going to be up there somewhere. The 21-year-old will no doubt enjoy the local support, as will the youngest ever Super Series competitor, Josh Blair from Swansea, Belmont. The home crowd advantage is going to be great because I've got a lot of support coming from my surf club, Swansea, Belmont, and um, a lot of my school friends will be there, so it should be great. A big surf today pounded Newcastle Beach, women's race favourite Carla Gilbert unperturbed. She along with 19 others including the Central Coast Peter Star, looking forward to the challenge. I like a big surf but uh, I've trained in all conditions and I'll be ready if it's flat or if it's big so I don't really mind. <laughs> Twenty-four crews took to Newcastle Beach this afternoon in some trying and testing conditions, several coming to grief. 
Locally, the Yamina crew from the Central Coast was the region's sole representative. They too knocked around by an unforgiving surf in their first heat. All took part in a four-race round-robin series, scoring points for each event, the top 12 advancing to the semi-finals, the first of which will be contested at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, the final at 11. Meantime, several of the Super Series and Devondale competitors went through final preparations before tomorrow's events. Carla Gilbert is a clear favourite in the women's. The men's far more open, with defending champion Trevor Hendy predicting a big performance from a fellow Gold Coaster. I think um, Dwayne Tyres, who got fourth in the last race, and after not a great preparation, uh, with a bit of luck, he could be the man to beat in this one. Five-year-old Stephen Corbett was drowned in the bath at his mother's flat in October last year. 37-year-old Elizabeth Corbett told psychiatrist Dr William Barclay, voices told me to do it. She also told a nurse at Mullawar Correctional Centre that he was naughty. He's the devil's child. A medical report from Dr Barclay was presented to Justice Hunt in Newcastle Supreme Court today. It says Mrs Corbett suffers from paranoid schizophrenia, a condition she developed in mid-1992. She experienced both delusions and hallucinations. Dr Barclay's report says it was in response to these hallucinations that she killed her son. He says mental illness is an appropriate defence to be put forward for her. Mrs Corbett has pleaded not guilty to murder. The trial is continuing. Jane Anderson, NBN News. As part of HMAS Newcastle's first overseas mission, the frigate visited Ube in Japan. It's significant from Newcastle's point of view coming here because of the sister city relationship that exists between Newcastle, New South Wales and Ube, Yamaguchi Prefecture, Japan. Deputy Lord Mayor Frank Rigby and Hunter Valley Industry and Commerce representatives were welcomed by the Mayor of Ube and other dignitaries. The frigate was a floating expo for the city of Newcastle, laden with, among other things, fresh produce from the Hunter. It's hoped Ube will become the gateway for trade from the Hunter. Police today were examining the blood-stained interior of the victim's vehicle. He was stabbed seven times in the right arm and shoulder after his Tirana was forced to stop by a white Gemini and two motorbikes in South Cessnock late yesterday afternoon. The attack took place outside Jean Martin's Gordon Avenue home. She warned her husband one of the motorbike riders was armed with a knife. I sang out to him, come back here, he's got a knife! But he never heard me and I don't think even if he'd have heard me, he was more interested to find out why they were on the footpath. Police say a female passenger in the Tirana, the male driver of the Gemini and two motorcyclists drove off. The victim made his way to Cessnock Police Station. He was rushed to hospital suffering deep wounds and shock.
Late this morning, police arrested a 34-year-old unemployed Cessnock man. He's been charged with being an accessory to a malicious wounding and will appear in Cessnock local court next month. The man was released on conditional bail. Police are still looking for the female passenger, described as around 25 years of age, medium height with brown hair, a male in his mid-twenties of medium height with brown hair and tattooed arms, and a male in his late thirties, tall, of solid build with dark hair and a beard. If anyone in the South Cessnock area has seen these two cars, the white Gemini, the two motorbikes, or the brown Tirana about 3pm yesterday afternoon, if they could give us a call and let, let us know about that. When the City Enhancement Plan was released late last year, it called for Newcastle to become a cleaner and healthier place to live. Council is determined to get the job done, but needs a plan of action. Well, it's a reflection of the community's attitudes and values through the community survey that they've said they want to see continued environmental improvement in Newcastle. Organisations and community groups are being called on to have their say, with a series of special workshops organised for next month. Well, I don't believe we can do this plan and ultimately implement it without the public. So it's going to be the community's plan, the city's plan uh, for the environment. With contaminated land, water and air quality top priorities, industries will be closely monitored. Council says it plans to take action if there are blatant breaches of the new environmental guidelines. Well, I think we need a mixture of measures. We certainly need a public who understands and is prepared to support and work with the council. Uh, education and ultimately there needs to be enforcement uh, when we're not receiving that cooperation. The plan is expected to be ready by April next year. Melinda Smith, NBN News. They may look like three girls in an upright, but the stars of Never Say Can't are guaranteed to provide triple the fun. A classic review stuff, funny stuff, um, lots of music, and, uh, and also sort of some interesting little bits from the heart. I'm just going to leave you with that as a teaser. Gillian Hyde, Penny Biggins and Valerie Bader pooled their respective talents to write the show, the title reflecting the general attitude of the performers. It simply means we decided to write a show that went to our strengths, not our weaknesses, and whenever we were sitting there going, oh, you can't write that, you go, uh-uh, you don't say that, you never say can't, we can. Between them, there's decades of experience in film and theatre and a healthy degree of friendly rivalry. You don't think you're a little tiny bit bossy? No, not at all. Or maybe, oh, you're the bossy one. Oh, dear. We take it in turns <laughs> to be bossy and we take it in turns to pacify. Yes. We actually get along very well. We've had no major traumas no. at all, which has been quite, it's been really nice, actually. Love it. Never Say Can't opens at the Playhouse on November the 2nd. The worst is yet to come. Yes. <laughs> I want to pass the physics most of all. <laughs> That's three weeks away.
For around 20 minutes yesterday, Leslie MacArthur was held hostage in her own home. Just after 8 o'clock, Leslie opened her front door to a woman who claimed she needed to use the phone because her car had broken down. As Leslie turned her back, she was grabbed from behind. I was kicking and, and screaming a little bit and all that and she just grabbed me and said, keep calm, keep calm, I won't hurt you, I'm going to rob the place but my husband's in the car. Leslie did stay calm. She was taken into the lounge room, gagged and her hands and feet bound by bandages. She then went into the bedroom and I could hear all the cupboards and drawers being opened. A small amount of money was stolen. Once the woman had left, Leslie hopped to the phone and dialed triple O. She was untied by police when they arrived. Leslie was kind to the lady. She even made her a cup of tea. She says she'll never again open her door to a stranger. I just think it's awful to think that you can't let somebody in to use the phone without being mugged. The woman police are seeking is between 30 and 40 years of age with a solid build and of medium height. She had short bleached blonde hair and had a scarf over her head. She was wearing a black top and orange brown tights. Jodie McKay, NBN News. It's a change of scenery for Mary Ann Witt, from environmental planning worker to ambassador for her region. Initially I was very stunned, I have to admit. Um, obviously a very great feeling. Uh, some very, very lovely ladies that were also participants in the awards, so yeah, it was a great feeling. The title is judged on a spectrum of criteria, but the emphasis is on raising public awareness about the work of the Spastic Centre. It was actually known as a quest. It was more of a beauty competition. Uh, it's come away from that now. It's basically judged on a public relations type role. Marianne has already raised five and a half thousand dollars, part of the seventy thousand dollars by the eight local contestants. She'll represent the Hunter in the Central Coast at next month's State Miss Australia titles. If she wins, she'll be on her way to the Nationals early next year. Richard O'Leary, NBN News. The chairman of the Greater Tari City Council's Traffic Committee is attempting to get council support for the return of the crossing. Councillor David West says he predicted pedestrian danger to roads and traffic authority representatives when they inspected the site in January this year. And I believe those represent representatives of the RTA need to once again readdress the situation. Because contrary to what people say, it is the RTA that own that road, it is the RTA that are the final arbiters on the problem, and it's the RTA that have to agree for changes to be made to the road. The elderly man who was hit by a car while attempting to cross the busy highway yesterday is still in a satisfactory condition in the Manning Base Hospital. Councillor West says the current situation will eventually claim a life unless something is done. He brought up the suggestion of reinstalling the crossing at the last council meeting but received no support from fellow councillors. I need to get information from the RTA in order to support what I'm trying to achieve and uh, it's up to me to convince council to change their mind. Councillor West raised the matter again at a traffic committee meeting this morning. During the discussion police said a crossing would create more pedestrian problems in the lead up to Christmas. The RTA today said its studies have revealed no problems associated with the crossing. The spokesman said the traffic congestion would eventually be alleviated when the Tari bypass was completed in 1998. Tracy Walsh, NBN News. Described as a blockbusting setter, too physical for rugby union, Calaviti Ney Soro made his debut for Fiji in the amateur code as a replacement for Noah Nandruku in 1990. He represented Fiji at the Rugby World Cup before recently switching codes, 
where he played in this year's test against the touring Frenchman. The Knights believe he has the potential to emulate the success of countryman and Canberra flyer Nandruku. We're hoping that he can be as good as uh, Nandruku, but um, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of fellows come over here from Fuji that haven't aimed up to the Nandruku, but uh, we're hoping this fellow will. Another centre and lock, both test players, have signed with the Knights who will conduct coaching clinics in Fiji after contesting the country's seven-a-side tournament later next month. We are trying to create a, a liaison with, with that country that uh, we're seen as not only trying to um, reap the benefits of their talent but also put something back into the game so that the, that talent can keep coming through. Meantime, while the Knights are hopeful of recording an operating profit for the last financial year, the club has announced it will relocate its offices to Derby Street in Newcastle, allowing for the ongoing development of Marathon Stadium. Confirmed as the new chairman of Austel just two days ago, Neil Tuckwell gave a breakfast briefing in Newcastle. As the regulator of Australia's telecommunications system, Austel's role is to ensure that competition and new technology produce real benefits for the end user. One key message is that while Newcastle will not move to six-digit phone numbers until 1998, businesses must update their technology now, or they may find their switchboards can't call a growing list of Sydney numbers. When the change comes for Newcastle, existing numbers will simply gain a 4-9 prefix. The one exception, Dudley, where numbers already start with 4-9, so new numbers will have to be issued there. On future phone costs, Mr Tuckwell gave the briefing organisers, the Australian Telecommunications Users Group, an assurance that competition will continue to make an impact in Australia. I think it will continue to improve here. We're seeing strong competition between Optus and Telecom and uh, as new players enter the market and as we move towards 1997 uh, we'll see prices look even better. Meanwhile Optus announced today that a $15 million investment will enable it to bring its digital mobile system online in Newcastle by February next year. Jim Sullivan, NBN News. In 1992, Newcastle's Joseph Walker stunned everyone, winning nine gold medals at the Intellectually Disabled Games in Madrid. Today, he was preparing for the International Paralympics World Swimming Championships in Malta, desperate to regain his world record in the 50 metres freestyle, which he recently lost. It makes you pretty mad, but uh, that helps, makes you more aggressive to, to get the record back. A member of the Hunter swim team, Joseph has spent up to four hours a day in the pool under coaches Eric and Shane Arnold preparing for the international meet. But today the 23-year-old decided he was better off in the sportsman's barber's chair getting his head shaved. I get it cut short, uh, so I swim faster mainly. <laughs> <laughs> and a bit of a psychological thing? Yeah, scare him a bit. <laughs> As the locks continued to tumble, Joseph's confidence escalated. The holder of six world records, complete with shaved scalp, destined for more gold in Malta. A few hours ago, it appeared the Eagles would be washed out for a second consecutive Friday night. But officials are determined to play. The only thing in doubt, the fireworks in between the doubleheader at Marathon Stadium. The Eagles have a similar roster to the one that split the series against the Sydney Blues last weekend. To another team making their presence felt in a national league, the Northern New South Wales Lions soccer team. They wound up preparations last night for their match against the Canberra Academy of Sport tomorrow. Coach Ken Kaiser was delighted with the team's first up 3-0 win over Marconi Academy last weekend. While the squad of 23 includes six experienced overage players, the emphasis is on youth, 
With seven 15-year-olds involved, the Federation even looking into relocating players from other centres on the north coast. They're investigating buying a house and putting in house parents. We're looking at the scheme that the Knights do for Rugby League. I mean, they're leaders in relocating country people and, and we can talk to those people and learn from them. And finally, the Maitland Centenary 10-over cricket competition will take place at Robins Oval on Sunday. 61 teams will contest the event, which will be attended by a host of former Test cricketers, including Doug Walters, Rick McCosker and Jeff Thompson. One hundred and twenty braved the conditions for the first city to airport run, organised to increase the awareness of the airport's proximity to Newcastle. The twenty seven kilometres were run at a hectic pace, Bruce Gillam breaking away in the first few kilometres along the harbour foreshore. Forty metres behind, ready to pounce, race favourite Lake Munmora's John Andrews, who finished seventh in the World Half Marathon Championships in Brussels last year. It wasn't long before he caught Gillam and established a winning lead on a challenging course. He finished in one and a half hours, five minutes clear of Gillam and will next April attempt to qualify for Australia's World Cup squad for Gothenburg. Over the next few months it's just going to be down to sort of hard, hard training and I've just used this as part of my preparation toward that. Broadmeadows Annette Quirk was the first woman across the line, finishing 19th overall in one hour and 53 minutes. Meantime, the Knights were also out early this morning at Cooks Hills Surf Club for their first training run. Trainer Ashley Jones put the squad through some beach work, Newcastle now training daily in preparation for next season. The club's first playing commitment is in the Fijian Sevens on November 26. The Melbourne Monarchs got off to a solid start in the first of their four matches for the weekend, leading 4-0 early in the game before the Eagles' Cameron Turner put the home side on the scoreboard. The Monarchs went further ahead and at 5-1 appeared to have secured the opening game. But the Eagles began a spirited comeback with last Sunday's hero Bob Henley again coming to the fore, launching another one out of the park. At 5-3, the Eagles then levelled the match, sending it into two extra innings, with home runs to Brett Schleider and then a second for Turner. The Eagles had their chances to win the match, but were thwarted by import Al Shirley, who broke the deadlock, giving the Monarchs a 6-5 victory. The Ford Laser had crossed to the wrong side of City Road in the Newcastle suburb of Merriweather, slamming into this oncoming semi-trailer. The car became wedged underneath the truck, the semi dragging it across the road through a guardrail and down an embankment. As the vehicle is being dragged across the, um, across the roadway, the car has caught fire. The semi and burning car came to rest in the backyard of a house in Little Edward Street. The driver of the laser was killed instantly, decapitated by the collision. Police praised the efforts of the truck driver who managed to steer his rig away from the house. He's managed to control the truck 
and just missed a house. The 27-year-old truck driver from Madawi was treated for minor injuries and shock at the John Hunter Hospital. A crane was used to lift the semi off the wrecked car. City Road was closed to traffic for three hours during the operation. Today, the two elderly residents of the house and their relatives surveyed the damage. They rushed out. The truck was in the yard with the car underneath the light and my father had to hurry up and get the hose and try and put the fire out. But they're very lucky, very lucky to be alive. Jane Anderson, NBN News. While looming storm clouds over the tiny town of Bandara promised much but delivered nothing, locals enjoyed the delivery of water by road. The bottled water, transported from soft drink company Shelley's in Sydney, was handed over and quickly loaded into waiting cars. The relief has come at a critical time. People in Bandara uh, are very badly off. Uh, some have been out of water for uh, up, up to two or three months. Others are not so badly off, but uh, some are in a very serious situation. The severity of the situation, a shock to someone seeing the plight for the first time. I came in across the creek out here and it was bloody bone dry, like the river actually, and I couldn't believe it when I seen it. The water drop would at least buy time until the heavens finally open. Amanda Bolger, NBN News. Social plans were cancelled in favour of attending the rally at Curry Football Ground this afternoon. We've been away but we come home for it and we attended the march and I'd really like to be counted as someone who is against it. Glenn Mill lives in Mitchell Street at Curry, just down the road from where the proposed dross plant would be built. So I don't want that place in my backyard. His view echoed the feelings of many at the meeting. We're just going to tell them we are not having the dross plant and this is the way Curry is going to be. We've, we've been too long under the shadow of Cessnock and been dictated to by the Cessnock councillors. Speakers addressed the crowd and a questionnaire was handed out asking them what future action they would be prepared to take. Are you uh, prepared to use sort of legal action, physical action? Will you give help monetarily? The information will be used to formulate a strategy to fight the proposed dross plant. Jane Anderson, NBN News.